Today we're going to be looking at the 39th chapter of Genesis, and it shows us the juicy story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. She tried to seduce him. Probably more than any other chapter in the Bible, this is the best chapter in the Bible, instructing us how to resist sexual temptation. But really it's far more than just a story of how to say no. The deeper meaning of this chapter shows us how to respond to unfair suffering, because that's what Joseph went through. Here's a piece I photocopied out of Parade Magazine a couple of years ago. It's a letter written in by Tara Fritch, 18 years old, from Riverdale, Maryland. And she writes, I was taught that God was the Almighty and was good, but the past few months have set me straight. There is no God, at least not the God everyone is talking about. If he or she was real, then there wouldn't be so much disease, death, hurt, and heartbreak in the world. In December, one of my friends lost her mother. In January, a friend was killed on his way to school. In April, a friend of the family lost his long battle with AIDS, and in May, one of my best friends also lost her mother. What God would do this to anyone? None that I know of or believe in. Wow. Well, there's one way to respond to unfair suffering, but that's the wrong way. And today here in the 39th chapter of Genesis, we're going to find four clues that show us the right way to respond to unfair suffering. Here's clue number one. Don't be surprised when you suffer unfairly. We read this uh, statement over in 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. Child abuse. Why does that happen? That's unfair. Two years ago in Nigeria, terrorists kidnapped 300 girls from their homes in Nigeria and sold them into sexual slavery. The whole world was shocked and reacted in, in horror, and some Green Berets from the United States went in there to rescue the girls, but most were never found. Why does God let that happen? And how about the, uh, the divorce that you went through, or maybe you're going through right now? You are actually a model husband or wife, and, uh, but then your, your spouse said, it's all over, I, I, I want out. You were a better husband or wife than many husbands and wives are who have been married for 50 years. And we marvel that they've been still married after 50 years because of all the trash they're dumping on their marriage partners. But they're still married, and you're the one going through the divorce. It just isn't fair, is it? Well, let's look now at our passage, Genesis 39. We'll start in verses uh, 1 through 7. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. 
So he left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. Now back in verse 1, Potiphar is called an official. This Hebrew word occurs 32 times in the Old Testament, 18 times it's translated as an official, and 14 times it's translated as a eunuch. So why not translate it that way here? Potiphar was a eunuch, it looks like. And, and therefore, Potiphar's wife had a very difficult marriage. She was frustrated sexually, and here she is, trying to seduce Joseph. Joseph's temptation was sudden, direct, aggressive, persistent, and relentless. Potiphar's wife was not subtle. She said in verse 7, come to bed with me. And that was a command, not a request. Remember, Joseph was a slave. Come to bed with me was uttered in the same tone of voice as when she would tell him, sweep the floor, or set the table for dinner. And this temptation was a head-on assault. Now, Joseph could have rationalized this. He could have said, well, you know, we're two consenting adults, and no one is going to get hurt by this. Yeah, okay, this is a sin, but if I do it, it'll really help my chances toward promotion. And if I refuse to do this with her, then I could suffer negative repercussions. After all, isn't it true that hell hath no fury like a woman scorned? <clears throat> but uh, let's see what he does do in verses 8 and 9. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Boy, what a godly response from Joseph. We'd think that the Lord would now step in and strike Potiphar's wife with a lightning bolt. But surprisingly, the temptation didn't go away. We see in the very next verse, 10, she spoke to Joseph day after day. But Joseph didn't get tired and eventually give in. Verse 10 says, though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. This is a good example of the command in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee from sexual immorality. There's a similar example in 2 Timothy 2, 22, flee the evil desires of youth. Both of those things Joseph, Joseph was doing. So here the idea, uh, <clears throat> yet, yet the temptation was still there. So now let's look at verses 11 through 15. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. So <clears throat> if Potiphar's wife couldn't have Joseph, she tried to destroy him. And by the way, this wasn't the first time that Joseph's coat was used to tell a lie. The first time was back in chapter 37 of Genesis verses 31 to 33. Remember this? Then they, that's Joseph's brothers, got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. 
They took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So, and now his coat is being used to tell another lie. So now back to the story, verses 16 to 20 this time. She kept his cloak beside her until his master, master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Why didn't uh, Potiphar just hang Joseph? Well, maybe because he wasn't fully convinced of the truth of his wife's story. But that was a little comfort to Joseph. For the second time now, he's finding himself at rock bottom. The first time was when his brothers threw him into a pit right before they sold him as a slave. And um, so this time, he's falsely accused, found guilty of a terrible sin without even a day in court, and thrown into a prison for it. So what's the lesson we learn from it? Is the lesson, dare to be a Joseph and you too can live a miserable life? No, no, that's not the lesson. It was in this prison that the deeper temptation came, deeper than the temptation of sexual seduction from Potiphar's wife. Now the temptation is to doubt God's goodness. Why am I here in prison for doing the right thing? You and I can understand why we suffer after we sin. But why do we suffer when we don't sin? If God loves us, why doesn't he reward our good behavior? Why did Joseph's perfect obedience cost him two years in prison? And when he finally gets out of prison in chapter 41, it says he had been there two years. Where was the God of justice? When we suffer unfairly, it's tempting for us to say, where was God when I was going through all that suffering? How could a loving God ex uh, let this happen to me? Now, instead of that reaction, Let's learn the first lesson from Joseph's experience. And again, the lesson is this. Don't be surprised when you suffer unfairly. Now here's the les second lesson. <clears throat> Don't expect God to tell you why you suffer unfairly. So now Joseph is in the prison. And he's there for two years. And all during that two years, <clears throat> God... <clears throat> did not speak to Joseph in his prison to explain to him how this experience was fitting into his divine master plan. But though God didn't explain, he was with Joseph. Verses 20 and 21 say, but while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. There was no answer from God to Joseph's questions except I am with you. God was with Joseph in joy and success also. We read that earlier in this chapter. We've already read it, but let me just show it to you again in verses two, and four, 2 to 4. The Lord was with Joseph. There's the key phrase. And he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, there it is a second time, in two consecutive verses. And that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. 
Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. So in verses two to four, we see that the Lord is with Joseph when, when Joseph is prospering. And now in verses 20 and 21, again we read that the Lord is with Joseph, but this time he's not prospering, he's, he's in prison. In Psalm 46, verse one, it says that God is an ever-present help in trouble. And that's what God was for Joseph. Sometimes as a pastor, people ask me, why did, why did such and such happen in my family? And the such and such is very, very bad news. And you know, my typical response is to answer, I don't know why God allowed that to happen to you or your family member. But I do know this, I do know that God is with you in this thing. Just two weeks ago, one of our women here in our church, one of our members, Carol Pauls, lost her grandson in death, Jeremy Dean. He was only 26 years old. He went to bed at night, and in the morning, you know, he, he didn't wake up. He was dead. So why, why would God let Jeremy Dean die like that? Well, I don't know, but, but I do know this, that with all of his family grieving, God is with them and also grieving along with them too. Here is something I cut out of the newspaper. It's a letter written, this was years ago, to Dear Abby, the advice columnist. Let me read it to you. This woman writes, my beautiful 22-year-old daughter was killed by a drunk driver. At first I screamed, he not only killed her, he killed me too, only I can't die. I then got on my knees and begged God, God, you can do anything. You can perform miracles. You can bring my daughter back to life. Please, God, let me trade places with her. Please let me lie in that coffin and let her out to live. She is only 22, God. She has never been married or experienced the miracle of being a mother. I am old, I have lived, I've had my chance at life, but she hasn't. Please, please, let me trade places with her. She didn't deserve to die. As you can see, Abby, I'm still here, and not because I want to be either, mostly because I didn't have the guts to pull the trigger or take the pills to get me out of the terrible pain and loss I live with every minute of my life. God didn't see fit to bargain with me. If the drunk who killed my precious daughter and me too, or the drunk who killed my precious daughter and me too, spent less than six months behind bars, today he walks in the sun while my little girl is in a dark grave with no sun. And though I also walk in the sun, my heart and soul are in that dark grave with her. God didn't answer my prayers, and I resent being told that I have no right to question God. If there is a God, and if I ever get to meet him face to face, you can bet your life I will have plenty of whys for him to answer. I want to know why my little girl died and that drunk was allowed to go on living. I love her more than my life, and I miss her so. I am mad that I am having to live in a world where she no longer lives, and I want to know why. So her big deal is she wants to know why, and she's blaming God for not telling her why. Well, God didn't tell that mother why her daughter died at the hands of that drunk driver. But in the Bible, God also didn't tell Job why his 10 children died all on the same day 
They were in a home and a tornado came along and went right through there and all 10 children died. And Job wanted to know why. God never told Job why. Not only did he lose all 10 of his children in death, but he lost all of his possessions, all his cattle and, cattle and herds and so forth. He even got deathly sick. All of that's in chapters 1 and 2. Then in chapters uh, 3 through 37, Job and his friends try to understand it. And Job keeps asking God, why, why? And finally, God speaks in chapters 38 to 41 of the book of Job, but he never tells Job why he suffered. Instead, God had 77 questions of his own for Job, and a typical one of those questions is in 38.4, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Job didn't need to know why his suffering happened. What he needed to know was who was in control. The best definition I've ever run across of God's sovereignty, it's kind of a you know, theological term, was uttered by a man I knew. He and I were acquaintances. I, I can't say that we were friends. I wish we had been, but, but, but we at least knew each other. His name is Curtis Hudson. He was a pastor of the largest church in the state of Georgia, Forest Hills Baptist Church. When he was 63 years old, he got cancer in his back, and he agonized over it. He was just, you know, in, in terrible, terrible pain. He wrote an article in a Christian magazine about his suffering and so forth, and uh, it was published about two weeks before he finally died. And in that article, he wrote this about God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty means he can do what he wants, when he wants, to whomever he wants, for as long as he wants, for whatever reason he wants, and he doesn't owe anyone an explanation. Wow. That is an absolute bullseye when it comes to God's sovereignty. Years ago, we had a couple in our church named Bob and Kim. I won't say Bob and Kim's last name, but a, a few of you know what their last name was. Well, anyway, <clears throat> so they're members of our church, and Bob just decides one day he doesn't really want to be living with his wife anymore in the home or anything, so he moved out. He did not have another girlfriend but still, he wanted to be on his own. So Kim was absolutely heartbroken over this. And Kim started praying and saying to God, God, I give you permission to do whatever it takes to bring Bob back home. And she prayed that way for two or three years, and Bob was still gone. Just They were both living in Dinuba, but not in the same house. And then one day, Kim was diagnosed with inoperable liver cancer. The same day that she received that diagnosis, Bob moved back home. Kim died about six months later. And during those six months, Bob was an absolute jewel of a husband. He was by Kim's side 24 hours a day, doing everything he could possibly do for her, just waiting on her hand and foot, praying for her, singing Christian songs to her, things like that. I, I witnessed this myself, seeing it in Bob. So Kim got her prayer answered. Lord, whatever it takes, do whatever you have to do to bring Bob home. After Kim died, I thought to myself, Lord, couldn't you have answered Kim's prayer in a simpler way than that without giving her liver cancer and then taking her life? She was only about 50 years old when she died. Couldn't, couldn't we have done something 
simpler than that? Well, I guess God could have. But, but God doesn't owe me or Bob or anybody else any explanations. By the way, just a postscript to that story. One year later, Bob got inoperable liver cancer, and he died in just a couple of weeks. But he died full of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of, some of you know of whom I'm speaking. All right, now here's point number three today. Trust God that he has a reason for your unfair suffering. Years later, Joseph would finally understand what God had been up to here in chapter 39, and we read about it in Genesis 50, verse 20, where he gets reunited with his brothers who had sold him into slavery, and he says to them, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And so here's, here's the whole logic of Joseph with his brothers. He's saying, if you had not sold me as a slave, I never would have come to Egypt. If I had never come to Egypt, I never would have met Potiphar and his wife. If I had never met Potiphar and his wife, I never would have gone to prison. If I hadn't gone to prison, I never would have met Pharaoh's two servants, the wine taster and the baker. If I had never met Pharaoh's wine taster and baker, I never would have met Pharaoh. And if I had never met Pharaoh, I never would have been able to save the whole world from starvation. Therefore, brothers, don't blame yourself for selling me into slavery. You, you had bad motives, but God meant it for good to me. Now notice this. Joseph was able to see how God was at work in his unfair suffering, those two years in the prison and being far from home and so forth, being a slave all that time. Uh, he could see how God had been at work in his unfair suffering only when the suffering was over. And for us, when we, when we suffer, we usually can't see a reason for our suffering while we're going through it. But Scripture assures us that God is at work for our good. Remember Romans 8, 28? And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So trust God that he has a reason for your unfair suffering. This is one of many areas of our lives in which God requires us to live by faith. Our ability to look back and understand our unfair suffering may take place only in heaven. But for now, in this life, God asks us to trust him. All right, now for my fourth and final point today. Look to Jesus when you suffer unfairly. Now, Joseph, in the book of Genesis, didn't have this answer. Jesus had not come along yet, but we do. Jesus was the only person who ever suffered without any trace of fault, he experienced much greater suffering than Joseph and was much closer to God. So why did Jesus suffer? Was it because God was unfair? Was it because God could not prevent Jesus' suffering? Well, that's kind of the thesis of this book, why bad things happen to good people, written by Rabbi Harold Kushner. Kushner had a son with progeria disease. This is the disease that makes you grow old and wrinkled and everything, bald and all, you know, when you're still nine years old and then you die when you're 11 years old or something like that. His son went through that. Kushner says in this book, which was a New York Times best-selling book, that the reason bad things happen to good people is that God isn't perfect. God can't do everything. God, God isn't all good. He, he's not all powerful. I'm going to read you now the last paragraph in this book. Are you capable of forgiving and loving God even when you have found out that he is not perfect? 
even when he has let you down and disappointed you by permitting bad luck and sickness and cruelty in his world and permitting some of those things to happen to you? Can you learn to love and forgive God despite his limitations as you once learned to love and forgive your parents even though they were not as wise, as strong, or as perfect as you needed them to be? And so he's saying God is like that. He's, he's not all that he's cracked up to be by the Bible. Well, <clears throat> you and I know that Rabbi Kushner did not uh, get it right. The real reason Jesus suffered is that we sinners wanted to do away with the sinless one because our lives were evil and we loved darkness rather than light. But God meant the death of Jesus for our good. In our act of putting Jesus to death, God's purpose for our salvation was fulfilled. His death cleansed us from our sins and made us right with the Father. By his wounds, we are healed. The unfair sufferings of Christ are our model now for our response to suffering. Because of Christ, we see much more clearly than Joseph did the way in which God's perfect plan unfolds through our sufferings. <clears throat> Since God has loved us in Christ more deeply than we can imagine, we have reason to endure unfair suffering <clears throat> with even more patience than Joseph showed. We can be confident that God will be with us in our pain and will use whatever suffering he allows in our lives for his glory and our good. I'll just close here by reading a little poem out of this book written by Helen Steiner Rice, What More Can You Ask? It's a book of her poetry. She's got a poem here titled, The Way to God. If my days were untroubled and my heart always light, would I seek that fair land where there is no night? If I never grew weary with the weight of my load, would I search for God's peace at the end of the road? If I never knew sickness and never felt pain, would I reach for a hand to help and sustain? If I walked not with sorrow and lived without loss, would my soul seek sweet solace at the foot of the cross? If all I desired was mine day by day, would I kneel before God and earnestly pray? If God sent no winter to freeze me with fear, would I yearn for the warmth of spring every year? I ask myself this and the answer is plain. If my life were all pleasure and I never knew pain, I'd seek God less often and need him much less. For God's sought more often in the time of distress. And no one knows God or sees him as plain as those who have met him on the pathway of pain. So, how do you respond to unfair suffering? How does God want you to do that? Don't be surprised when you suffer unfairly. Don't expect God to tell you why you're suffering unfairly. Trust God that he has a reason for your unfair suffering and look to Jesus in your unfair suffering. And that's exactly what we're going to do by coming to the Lord's table now in conclusion to this worship service. There never was an act of unfair suffering worse than when the sinless God himself was nailed to a tree and bled and died for the sins of the world. Jesus never committed any sin and yet he suffered more than anyone has ever suffered. And not physically is the idea, but spiritually because when he was on Calvary's cross, God dumped the, the sins of the world on Jesus and judged Jesus for all of those sins. Jesus took the punishment that I deserve, you deserved for our sins. Nothing was ever more unfair than that. And yet, no greater blessing has ever come to the world 
than through the death of Jesus. And that just reinforces in our own minds that however unfairly we may be suffering, God can bring good out of that too. So this morning, as you partake of the bread, which reminds us of his body that was given for us, as you drink from the cup, which reminds us of the blood that he shed on Calvary's cross, thank God for, for suffering for you so that you could be forgiven and you could have a place in heaven. Heavenly Father, we come humbly and thankfully to this communion table. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, whom it represents. And in our blindness and sin, we nailed him to the cross. And yet you brought the greatest good to us out of that greatest miscarriage of justice the world has ever seen. Thank you for being a miracle-working God. Thank you for having a purpose in the suffering of Jesus, and therefore we trust that you've got pur a purpose in our suffering too. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.